We're starting off here with some colors that we used in our last painting. Along the bottom row are three that are mixed from Italian Terra Verde. In the lower left, we have Italian Terra Verde mixed with Egyptian Violet or a Dioxazine Violet. In the center is another pile of the same. So I've split that larger pile of green violet into two. And then in the far right lower corner, we have Italian Terra Verde mixed with phthalo blue to make a very dark blue-green. In the upper left-hand corner, we have ultramarine blue and white. Next to that is ultramarine blue and white with a little bit of the violet mixed in to darken it up and to um, warm it up even more. So that one, both of those are left over from our last painting and have just been moved over to the palette. On the right hand side you'll see two mounds of uh, Italian green ochre. If you don't have Italian green ochre, remember that you can make those from yellow ochre with a tiny little bit of ultramarine blue added in. For this painting, we're going to need a dark reddish violet to capture that sense of light that's coming from the street light. So we're going to use that mound of dark terra verde and uh, violet to create that. So I'm going to take some of the crimson and start mixing that in until I start getting more of a red violet. This is going to be the color of the fence at the bottom and it's going to take actually a good bit of that red to make it more of a red violet. There we go, that's beginning to get there. Now it's not as dark as this in that area. And as y'all will remember, the crimson and the purple are transparent colors, they're dye colors. So to make them a little bit more intense, I'm going to add a little white. You see how little white that is on the knife. Better to add a little bit at a time than to go too far or too fast. All I want to do is to make it just slightly opaque so that that color comes up a few values from our dark purple. Okay, it still needs a little bit more, so a tiny little bit more white. And there are a couple of different ways you can mix this color, a couple of different directions you could go or variations that you can make. Um, I'm going to dull it a little bit in a second with some orange, but you could have achieved almost the same thing by adding the Fanchon Red or the Naphthol Red instead of the Crimson. But I really wanted that reddish crimson undertone to show through, which it will, even though I'm getting ready to dull it down a little bit. I'm going to dull it and warm it up by adding that orange. Okay, so that it's almost a brownish purple. The orange and the purple are close complements, not exact complements, but close complements. So there's a little bit of a dulling effect. So I need a lighter variation on that as well, a lighter and warmer. So I'm going to leave that as the main color there and pull that up to the top. And I am going to add a little bit more white. Remember, there's a tipping point at which colors will begin to 
tip over and go dull. So I've lightened it. I'm about to brighten it in just a second by adding another warm. So right now that's a kind of dullish purple. And I am going to add a good bit more of the orange. I'll warm it up significantly. See how much warmer it is? And then I'll also get a little bit of the red. Which I ran out of. So red it up. It's going a little too yellow. See, that's an intermediary, and I need a light. And for that light, it's just going to be a tiny little bit of this. And then I'm going to go and add a good bit of Indian yellow. Really warm it up, and I have to add a little bit more white, because remember the Indian yellow, especially the Williamsburg, is very transparent. So right now it looks like dull mud. When I add a little bit of white to it, that's really going to sing. It's going to be one of my lightest colors in there. And it's not going to take very much of that at all. Still needs a little tiny bit more white. So there's enough of a contrast there. So think back to our color chart that we made and what that tipping point is. And remember for Indian yellow, you can add a little bit more white than you might expect before the color begins to dull. So that's the lightest value for that fence down there where in the building where it's catching the light. Also going to use that for the street light, for the pole of the street light. Now we're going to need a light color that's going to be the light of the street light. And in the paint the photograph it looks white. That's not how it really looked in person. Keep in mind that cameras create illusions and cameras can only expose for one part of an image when there's high contrast and so it will exaggerate the contrast in value. So the contrast was not as high when I looked at it with my eye as it appears in the photograph. So I'm going to lighten it up and add some more yellow to make it more of a yellowy color. So that the most intense spot of the light becomes a little bit more yellow, a hair a bit lighter. So go back to that range of values that we talked about in the study and it was about a value 4 to about a value 9. That's right about where we are with that as well. I have gotten a little bit of yellow into my white and I want to pull that off before it gets picked up by something else. Okay, so there we have the value for the light. We also have a white building on the right hand side. Now white when it is in shadow or low light situations 
we'll go blue. And we have two blues up here. Just need a little bit more of the white. But they are too intense and too dark. So we need a little bit lighter version. And that is going to be our building in shadow. And I'm going to also add a little bit of our more violet one to darken that up a little bit more. That's going to help that relate to the background and to the other colors, that purple in particular, that are used below. So there's a little bit of purple in most of these. So it needs a tiny little bit more because it's darker than you think. There we go. Okay, so this is kind of halfway in between those in hue and a little bit lighter. Now, where the light is striking it, I'm going to add a little bit of green ochre, which is a dull orange. So I want you to see what a difference that makes. It tones down our blue significantly. That's the direction we want to go. So I'm going to leave a little bit of it over there so we'll know where we came from. Pull our blue over here. Add a little bit more green ochre to it. And it's going to take the edge off of the blue dull it down just a little bit. If we want to show where the light is hitting it in streaks, because that is a building that has some brick to it, you can make a lighter value and a warmer value by adding a little bit more of the ochre to it and a little bit of white. So we need to warm it up first and then we'll raise it to the appropriate value. So there it's warmer. It needs to be warmer still so there's a contrast in temperature. That's warmer, and we're going to lighten. Now that's going to, beginning to dull it down too much. That doesn't look like light, does it? So if you think about what we might need to add to that, that we already have out, We'll green that up a little bit. Take a little of our yellow from over here. There we go. So to simulate light, even that low light, we need to warm it up. 
we can lighten it up a little bit more if we need to, but we don't want to completely lose the intensity. So it's better to have that warm, cool contrast to simulate a little bit of the light hitting it than to lighten it up too much in value with white. Then we also have just a tiny little bit of roof that is more of a darker version of this. So we'll take some of our blue violet and a chunk of our yellow ochre. We'll bring some of our blue violet down to a similar hue. And that becomes the color of the roof. So you can see that the green ochre is a very, very useful color for dulling out blues. It makes some really wonderful um, blue grays, warm blue greens that are fairly dull. So there I think we have just about got our different blues together. It's just a little bit of leftover. I'm going to put it over here in our blue. So we have our colors roughly worked out for our nocturne. We can make a little bit lighter. Oops. I hear a blue in there. A little bit lighter yellow on the side just to make sure we have two different values, two different intensities. Because it's night, it has just a tiny little bit of dullness to it. So I'm adding just a tiny little bit of our very useful green ochre to it. It's going to take the edge off of the yellow without dulling it in the same way that white would. Okay, those are our colors that we're going to use and we're ready to jump in and get started on our nocturne painting. So here we have our composition drawn off really quickly. Use the big knife again to just draw off the main shapes. Not trying to draw details and not trying to draw objects. We have a huge big oak tree. Um, it is a big oak in an old neighborhood in Savannah. So it is enormous. It towers over the surrounding buildings. There are a number of openings in that tree mass, that color mass for sky. We're not going to try to put those in at the moment in the beginning in the block in, except for this small one over here. Um, it's a fairly large sky hole. The little ones will come back in and add towards the end. Now one of the things that I want you to remember and to note is that the lamp post in the photograph smack dab in the center of the composition. So I am moving it over to the right where it overlaps with the building on the right hand side so that it improves the composition because that lamp post and the light becomes a focal point. I don't want that ever to be smack dab in the center. So I really want you to see that you can do that and to realize that you are the editor of your painting and you can shift and move things when it's necessary. So I've adjusted values and adjusted composition to take into account the fact that the camera lies a little bit and that I need to adjust the composition and where things fall so that it's a stronger composition without that centralized focal point. 
So now that we have those basic masses drawn off, look how little line work there is on there. I'm going to take my dark purple and begin to block in those tree masses. And just as we did in the broccoli painting, we are going to keep these thin, not thick. So these masses are fairly thin, not thick areas of paint. If you keep it thin, you can go back in on top of it and add other colors and thicker paint and manipulate and make variations on that. If you put it on too thick to begin with, it is hard to go back in and add anything different to what's already there. So I am going to use that dark, dark purpley blue is sort of an undertone before I even go to the phthalo green blue. So we have a dark purpley green, and we have a blue green. Both of them almost the same in value. But I want some of that purple to show through, so that's another reason why it's there. Now, I am going to pull that around the area that is going to be my lamp. And I am also using it to begin to very roughly define where that roof line is. Remember this area at the bottom is still dark, it's just more of a red violet than the violet. And when you need to, shift and turn that painting. Now one of the things I like about the old neighborhoods in Savannah is that you have that contrast of architecture against landscape. So it is not your typical urban environment. So you've got the height of the tree, unusual in a lot of urban areas, against the old building. And I can bring that up, and it doesn't have to be a perfect circle right now because the purple is going to get adjusted some. Just approximate a circle. It's going to get adjusted. So there is my initial part of the house. I'm going to let a little bit of purple come in over here in the shadow of that roof line because I want it color-wise to connect. There's another shadow down here. This building on the right is an old carriage house. So it has a very interesting texture and surface to it. Now we're going to get some of the red violet that goes down towards the bottom. And this is for the fence line. 
are just going to rough in right now. That runs all the way across. So this is a wooden fence that's being struck by light. So that makes it really nice and warm. And we're going to go back and add more details in just a minute so it can stay fairly thin. Same thing on this side. So this is just an underpainting. A really nice warm reddish violet. This roof line over here is a tin roof. It is red in strong daylight. At this time of day, it is more of a red violet, almost an orangey red violet. But it's part of that contrasting geometric urban shape that we have in here. Okay, then. We are going to take some of our darker blue from over here, our neutralized blue for our building, and we're going to begin to block that building in with that neutral color. And yes, I know there's some lighter areas in there, but we need to get the darker dark in first. And one of the things that happens to that building as it goes down is that it blends in to the no tan, the darkest shadow area. So now we're going to go up here. A little of that purple show through in places. And we're beginning to add in some of those details of the roof line that I talked about earlier. And again, just as we've done before, you don't have to worry about where the shapes and forms, and by shapes I mean the shapes and patterns of color, not the shapes of objects, but where they meet, because we're going to refine those as we work along. So I want to bring a little bit more of that violet in over here. Because remember, I said these shapes begin to meld a little bit. Even the fence on this side is pretty dark. And we will come back in and smooth that out a little bit in a minute. And we can also take some of our violet into this lower edge, which is also fairly dark. Remember, our violet is more opaque. So it's going to help set up the red violet. I'm blending it up into that red violet a little bit. I'm going to turn it again. And I can blend from the other direction. You are not going to see a whole lot of slats in that fence. You'll see a few slight indications. It's a fence, and we'll put those in at the end. 
but you're not going to see lots of pickets on the fence. So paint what you see, not what you know. So it's already shaping up into some very distinct forms. We have the roof of the tin roof of the adjacent garage, the fence, the carriage house behind, the tree behind that, and we have left a space for our lamp post. Let's add in our sky. Just as in our broccoli painting, we're going to contrast the darker, warmer purpley blue with the more pure ultramarine blue. We are not going to let the sky get quite as light as it appears in the photograph. Remember I said photos lie. It was early evening, so the camera, actually iPhone, um, made that look significantly lighter than it really was. So we are going to have fairly dark sky to correct for what the camera misread. So I talked about that a little bit in the concept video. If you have any questions about that, be sure to ask in the Facebook group or in our next Q&A. And I can show you specifically a little bit more about that. So, just like before, I'm going to apply the lighter one fairly lightly. And especially where it comes up close to the next color, I want that to be very thin so I can go back and forth a little bit. As I've mentioned before, you don't want to have a hard, sudden transition from one blue to another. You want to have a gradual one. So I am lightly blending as I go. And I can add some more in just a minute when I need to. Try to let that set up a little bit. Add in that larger hole. I mentioned earlier. And then go to our area down here. And because this is going to be a little bit sharper edge, I'm going to keep that really thin and after that paint has set up under these lights, it's not going to take long. I'll come back in and adjust that a little bit. So on top of this violet, dark violet, we're going to use our phthalo blue-green mixture to begin to layer on top really loosely on top of the violet, letting some of the violet show through. Because our blue, our phthalo blue-green mixture, is strong contrast between warm and cool. It's going to give us a lot of variation. You can let some of those little edges stay purple and it will add to the dimensionality of what you're working with. Now, I am going to let a good bit of that purple show through as I get close to my lamppost because that will 
exaggerate, add to the sense of illumination. Pick up a color that you didn't intend to. You can either blend it if it's not a problem color-wise, hue-wise, or you can wipe it off if you need to. So bring that green on down in, and again, turn as you go. And I am not going to take the phthalo blue green mixture all the way down. Because it warms up as it goes down. And I want to maintain some of that. So I'm going to start mixing some of the purple into it at that point so that as it gets close to the building and on down in here that it becomes a little bit more of the purple than the green. And I'm removing some of the blue that may have gotten up into my violet so that I can do a dance back and forth between the two. So I can pull some of my blue-green mixture down into there and provide a contrast and come back and pull some of that out as I need. So it's a dance back and forth between the two colors. And what I mean is so where I put on more of that phthalo blue mixture, where I might want to pull some of it out and break up that line a little bit, I will quite literally go back in there, tweak it, play with it a little bit. Use my smaller knife to alter that line just a little bit. And then to get a little bit of my blue, go in there. That's what I mean by dancing back and forth between the two. So. can literally dance between back and forth between the two colors. And that's possible because the paint is on there thin enough to begin with. There, there is room to do that kind of a dance. So I can even go back and pull a little bit of my purple down in there. I can also get my bigger knife or bigger brush if that's what you're working with and I can go back in there and lay more color on top in the areas that are further away from the kind of dance line. So then as I mentioned, I'm going to use more of the purple down here. So I'll blend it a little bit. So it doesn't suddenly change from green, the more blue-green to the 
purpley green and make it a slightly slower change. holding my knife almost completely flat. I need a little bit right here in this corner. Then I also need a little bit of my more blue green. here. Going back and working some of the directional marks out. They feel like they don't belong there. Where I need to, where I feel I need to, I can go back in and pull some of that blue green out away from that lamp and pull a little bit more of the purple in instead. So here's where we are at right now, and we need to pull in some of the lighter elements on the side of that carriage house. Also want to go back over here and notice that I am not trying to make that a hard edged line. It's an old building. It is not going to be hard edged. There are imperfections, there are changes in direction on the brick, and if you try to make it hard-edged and modern looking right there, it's just going to read wrong. So let some of those imperfections stay. Let some of the roughness of the line remain. And let's pull some more of this dark down into our roof line. Now the next thing I want to pull in relatively quickly is some of our yellow for our um, lamp. So we are going to take some of that reddish violet that we had in there before down below. We're going to pull that in right here around our tree so that we are warming up that area around it even more. I'm going to put the darker yellow in first. I'm 
and then we're going to leave a space for the lighter yellow. So, go over and, like I just dropped a little bit of it in below. It's okay. You can come back and pull it out. So, I am putting thicker paint on top of thinner paint. If you need to, you can always do the dance back and forth. So, if you feel like you're losing control there, scrape back a little bit. And it'll mix some in that scraping. That's not a bad thing right here where I got that little bit of yellow down there and I didn't mean to. I can pull that off and pull a little bit of my blue back in. Cover it right back up. Gone away. Like I erased it. But I'm taking my darker yellow. And I'm going to do the same dance that I did before. So I am not worrying about overlapping into the area where the lamp goes. In fact, I want it to. So my lighter value is going to go on top of my darker value. And I am intending to scrape back in order to let some of that mix. So that's that dark yellow that I made, almost a brownish yellow. You see how that mixed? If I had just put white on there, it would not look right. So one of the things I like about that street light is it kind of stands in for the moon. You could not see the moon. It was behind too much stuff. And we'll come back and continue to lighten that as we go a little bit. One of the next things I want to put in is where that light pole is. And we're going to use a little bit of our ochre to put it in because it has a thick enough body to it. This is just straight green ochre that I can apply a line of it on there. Remember the light pole? It's just a line. I'm going to go right through that illuminated section so that I'll have to scrape back in a minute. But I can put that in and indicate a little bit of it below and it's not going to stay like that. So if you make your lines so they don't match up, like I just made them so they don't match up, The wonder of paint and scraping back. Put it in more carefully. And then just scrape back to get rid of it. So it's going to get blended significantly in just a minute. A lot of that is going to disappear again. So you're going to take that down and let it gradually just disappear into the purple. Because our post is not that easy to see once it gets down. If we need to, we can always take a little bit more of our dark and bring it up against that light. as needed. And we can knock it back a little bit as well in just a minute or two. Now the same thing happens to the top of the pole. The only part that you really see clearly is really that bottom. So this top part can very quickly just disappear. It does not have a hard edge. And it will make it kind of disappear into the purple. So 
So then what we need to do next is to look down at our red tin roof down here. Maybe make it counterbalance what we're seeing some of up here. And to make it show up a little bit more, because this red violet is so transparent. Remember I said the green ochre is great as a base for other colors. I'm going to take some of that middle warm value that we mixed. Do you see how the transparent ochre really just becomes a carrier for this more intense color? So there we have our more intense color. It's a little bit more opaque. And I can add that in for our roof. And notice that it is more reddish violet here and then it goes more purple over there. Just goes dark. So, put our roof in. And again, it is just that part of the roof that is catching a little bit of the street light. It does not go all the way across. So I can actually take some of my darker reddish violet and pull that up on in. And this is going to be that dance again that I've mentioned before. So I've got that red violet down and I can go back and catch a little bit more of that roof line if I need to. There's a little bit of an indication of some planks in the wood. Right at the base of that lamppost. So I'm letting the color underneath act as the shadow. I'm pulling the light across. And I'm going to want to put a slightly shorter one over here as if they're falling out of the light and they're in shadow again. So there's my fence at the bottom. And one of the things that I'm noticing is that this green ochre is too different from what I've got down here. So this is one of those things that you can adjust as you go. So instead of leaving my light post being green ochre, I'm going to use that reddish violet color that I mixed and insert that. Then it will connect to the fence as well as the rest of the red violet. Come back and tweak it in just a minute. Then we also have our lighter blue. Which forms part of the 
the brick pattern on our building. So the goal here is to lay it down. And don't mess with it. If you keep going back and tweaking it, you're going to lose the sense of the brickness of it. You have some of that same color up here at the top on the edge of the roof. And a little bit of that more muted warm color is going to come in as well. And I'm going to leave that just towards that top to get the little bit of it that goes on the roof line, switch to a smaller knife or brush because it is just going to be right here on the tip. Not on the whole thing. And a very tiny amount. So then I can use that smaller knife to go back in and finesse these edges as I want. To indicate the moonlight or the light, the slightly cooler light hitting the side of that building, that carriage house. I want to correct one thing, which is the perspective line here. And then I'm going to need to apply a little bit more of that dark right there. And go back over here. Do a little bit of blending. Very necessary. I'm going to take, because I have used up all my purple, a little bit of my dark blue. So I do still need some dark, dark there. Added some purple to it. I'm going to have to mix some of my Terra Verde and purple mixture because otherwise it's going to stand out a little bit too much. This blends in right here. So I need my greeny purple. It's 
going for way more purple, as you'll remember, than green. Here we go. And go ahead and wipe that knife so that you won't forget and use it later. Wipe this one before I get started. And then I'm going to break this up some because this blends in a whole lot more. Does not stand out as much as it appears to right now. And there is a shadow right there. So you can decide how much of the patterning on the building you want to leave in and how much you want to take out. If it becomes a little too busy for you, you can always go back, take some of that lighter blue, where necessary. Let me just scrape this back. So if I wanted to make it a little less busy, then I'm going to forget about those striations in the brick. I'm going to concentrate instead. Get rid of this one too. On the overall value patterns. Go with the blue of the building there. That's not as hard a line right there because purple, our dark, dark actually comes down into the side of the building. Right here, where it creates a shadow. And we can either use just this lighter blue indicate this light pattern right here. And add those remaining darks. So I can look at the lamp post. and decide exactly how far down I want it to go. I can pull a little bit more purple. into the fence line at the bottom. If it feels like that has gotten a little bit on the heavy side, and I can break it up a little bit more. So again, it can become a dance between the dark and the light.
and you can always scrape back if you need to. So don't be afraid to scrape. One of the advantages of scraping is it leaves some of the paint behind. So it kind of does some of the blending for you. And if you feel like you need to pull some out of that roof to make it look a little bit more illuminated. And remember I said that we could put in some of the sky holes at the end. And we can do that now. We can begin to break up the foliage just a little bit. And you're going to want to do it with the darker blue because where the sky shows through becomes darker. And where you want to break up. that darker blue down, pull a little lighter blue across it. Then pull back out where you're needed. So that it begins to break up that pattern of the darks and the lights just a little bit more. So if you need to pull a little purple back into it, that's all you have to do. So it's just that dance back and forth. You can soften some of those edges. Add a little bit more variation and variety to it. Now where there's a definite larger mass of sky hole is right up in here and you can break that up some if you want to and we can pull some of our darker blue look at the overall pattern of it and it is roughly following where these larger masses are. And then you're going to go back and tweak those and pull a little bit more of the purple back across it. We also need to come up to this upper edge and this is a little bit too regular. So I can Break that silhouette up a little bit. I can pull a little of this off so that that silhouette gets broken up a little bit. I can break that one up a little bit. In other words, go back and forth with the, the edge there and make the silhouette the edge of the tree a little bit more visually interesting. Trying to keep to the pattern the, of oak tree. Okay. 
because it is an oak. You want to suddenly turn it into a different type of tree. Keep looking back and forth, turning it to see if you've gotten too much or too little. If it's become a little bit too linear, you can break some of that up. If you have things that are looking a little too regular, you can tweak those edges. Don't be afraid to go back in and tweak those edges a little bit. You can absolutely do that. You can also apply that sky hole color with the knife itself, the smaller knife itself. Just think about how you're breaking that up. and what kind of patterns you're beginning to make. So for example, the blue comes in here a bit more than I had at first. So that that's not as hard and geometric a line right there. So breaking that up a little bit makes it look more tree-like and less totally massive. It needs to not be so solid that it doesn't read as a tree anymore. If you go a little too far, like right here, push the other way. Then you can come back in and pull your dart Pull that dark down. I need to pick up a little bit more purple. And at some point, leave it alone. to a stopping point and we have our nocturne. I also thought I would show you all how I sign paintings because that has come up a couple of times in the Q&A and I don't sign with a brush I sign with a nail so to sign this one all I would need to do, hold my masonry nail right here on the right hand side and sign it. And it scratches through the paint to go to the layer below and leaves a vis visible signature without it being obtrusive. One of the things I want to say about signatures is the signature should not be more dominant than the painting. So don't use a color for your signature that is such a strong contrast that your eye goes right to that and it becomes a focal point. Make sure there's enough difference that you can read it, but not so much difference that it becomes a focal point. So I want to see y'all make an effort on your nocturne. 
and then post those results in the Facebook group. Happy painting!